Okay, yeah, let's start. So <clears throat> yesterday we couldn't finish the uh, day before yesterday we couldn't finish the lecture in time and uh, due to some technical problems. I apologize for that. So uh, today first we are gonna finish uh, the previous lecture and then we'll take a five ten minutes break around eleven o'clock and then we can continue with today's lecture. So um, we finished up around this point when we were discussing about sorry, when we were discussing about the stem cells. And uh, there were, I told you about different classes of stem cells. There are embryonic stem cells, adult stem cells, induced pluripotent and perinatal stem cells. And then there are different advantages and disadvantages of using these stem cells for different purposes, mainly therapeutic purposes. Uh, some there are some ethical issues as well, which we are gonna consider today in the later part of the talk. So, and there are then different types of adult stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, neural epithelial skin, different. And now it, it is kind of scientists now believe that there are adult stem cells in almost every tissue in the body. It's just that it's not easy to relocate them or it's not easy to manipulate them and to induce them to start making the, that organ. But maybe in future it's going to become, it's, it's gonna become possible maybe. So we will start with uh, this hematopoietic system, which is an excellent example of um, uh, how differentiation proceeds during uh, both during embryogenesis and during adult life. And uh, so hematopoiesis is basically the formation of blood and there are many different types of blood cells and they are all seem to be derived from uh, one single cell. Although nobody is ever able to uh, isolate that single cell, but there are experiments that showed that all these uh, different derivatives or different differentiated forms of the blood, they came from one uh, common progenitor. Which is uh, which was a multipotent stem cell. Uh, so then there is this question about multipotent versus pluripotent stem cells. And can anybody tell me what what is the difference between multipotent and pluripotent? It's very easy, guys. I think I'm gonna ask uh, individually, then I'm, I'm gonna start asking individually by naming the person just randomly, and then it might be more of a discussion. Would that work or any volunteer? Okay, let me see. So, Savera Manzar, do you have an answer to this question? Can you hear me? Anybody? Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. Is Savera Manzar there? Okay. Nurul Huda Nadim. So most of you are not there, it looks like. Who is here? Ahmad, are you there? Yes, sir. Do you have a response to this question? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Do you know what is the difference between multipotent and pluripotent stem cells? Yeah, uh, pluripotent uh, uh, give rise to almost all type multiple type of cells while i think multipotent are limited to few 
Yes. So that wasn't a very difficult question. Rise. Yes. So pluripotent can give rise to all kind of cells. Uh, uh, cells. Different. They can be differentiated into all kind of cells. And multipotent have a very limited ability of differentiation. Not extremely limited, but they are more limited in their uh, differentiation potential than pluripotent. Um, okay, so that's good. Um, so the uh, uh, blood cells, they have different origins. They have different sources during uh, the embryonic life and in the adults. So in the early embryonic life, they are derived from the mesoderm in the yolk cell blood, blood islands and then in the region of aorta. And then later on in the later embryonic life, they were uh, they're, uh, basically they started differentiating in the fetal liver and eventually in the bone marrow. And uh, the major source of, or the, uh, the only source of uh, hematopoietic stem cells in the adults is in the bone marrow. So this hematopoietic system, it basically constitutes um, a miniature developmental system. And it's, uh, it has been studied very extensively and it basically led to a lot of discoveries in how the differentiation process actually continues in uh, mammalian cells. So um, we can start by, if you can, yeah, if you can, uh, if you follow this uh, image, um, I'm sorry for this um, very bad cropping of the images because I need to, I had to take images from my mobile phone and then include it into it. Uh, so I uh, apologize for the, uh, yeah, nerdiness here. But um, so if you uh, consider this multipotent hematopoietic stem cell, so you see that there is this arrow that goes into itself. And I discussed it a little bit yesterday uh, that the stem cells, they have this potential of uh, self-sustainability. And we will, uh, we're gonna discuss it a little bit further here, but uh, today, but just to, uh, you know, uh, start this discussion here. That, so the stem cells, they, uh, even the multipotent stem cells or the uh, pluripotent stem cells, all the stem cells, their uh, common property is that they can renew themselves. And um, there are a lot of uh, debate on this, how, what is the mechanism of their renewal and how a stem cell can give rise to uh, both uh, can give rise to two completely different daughter cells. So one daughter cell that uh, is exactly like itself, and then another daughter cell that is basically a uh, progenitor for further uh, differentiated cell types. And I will come to that later. But so the multipotent hematopoietic stem cell, it can give rise to three different lineages of, of cells, but it starts with two uh, different progenitors. And then one of this progenitor give rise to two lineages. So erythroid lineage and myeloid lineage. And then this on the right side, this progenitor give rise to the lymphoid lineage. But the, then the question is, how does this um, um, uh, specification, it, uh, what does specifies that these two progenitors they, uh, that they differentiate into different lineages or they differentiate into different uh, type of cells. And I think we discussed it a little bit yesterday, uh, but we're gonna discuss more today. So it's there on, uh, I think, okay, let's go to that. And in the next slide, let me just uh, finish here by uh, explaining a little bit. So, uh, so there are these um, two different progenitors for uh, the erythroid and myeloid and lymphoid lineages. And then you can, as you can see that then this uh, uh, multipotent progenitor can give rise to the erythroid lineage, which includes erythrocyte and platelets. And then you have uh, part of the myeloid lineage comes from this progenitor and part of the myeloid lineage comes from this progenitor. So again, there is a very high degree of specificity uh, and uh, different kind of different combinations of transcription factors, different combination of uh, extracellular factors, we will come to that later, that defines what kind of uh, final terminal differentiation this progenitor is gonna end up with. Uh, a few words about uh, the differences in these cells. So the finally differentiated cells, they are morphologically completely different. And uh, for example, um, uh, erythrocyte, 
anyone can tell me what is the distinguishing most distinguishing feature of an erythrocyte that you are you don't find find it in any other cell of the body anyone yeah, they do not have a nucleus they do not have a nucleus excellent so uh, uh, in humans they are uh, mammals the erythrocytes they uh, they completely evict the nucleus but in birds they do have the nucleus but it's transcriptionally inactive and we'll come to that later and similarly uh, so there are platelets and then the myeloid lineages and they are sorry and they are uh, distinguished by distinguished uh, at the microscopic level by the presence of granules or by the presence of their multi lobed nucleus and then we have a very specific, a very uh, special type of uh, uh, white blood cells called lymphocytes, so B and T lymphocytes. And they also have a very distinguishing feature that none of the other cells have, mam mammalian cells have. Anybody knows about that? So B and T lymphocytes, they're actually their DNA or their genetic material is not similar to the rest of the genome. They have uh, permanent or they have irreversible alterations to their genomic DNA. Anybody knows why? Why and how their DNA is irreversibly changed? The B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Fatima Rahman, do you know why B lymphocytes, what, what does B lymphocytes do in the body? Um, sir, they, yeah. they, are role, they, they are role in the immune system. Yeah, so what is the specific, there's a very specific function of B lymphocytes. Um, I think they produce uh, 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 they're important for the memory. So they also, uh, the, generate antibodies. Yeah, antibody production of the of And the then they antibody. yeah, then they remember what kind of antigen they have uh, encountered, and that's the cellular memory basically that you were referring to. But um, so they're, they have the ability to, to recognize uh, foreign or self antigens, mainly foreign antigens. And then they, their DNA is irreversibly altered in a way in this VDJ recombination. I don't know if you've learned that, but uh, yeah. So their DNA is irreversibly altered and they uh, recognize uh, it in their kind of memory in this way. So so that they uh, always, whenever the next time this antigen comes in again, they um, uh, start making this antibody because they have, uh, they have made this antibody gene so, uh, recomb in a recombination fashion. So, uh, and similarly, T lymphocytes, they are cytotoxic cells and they, they do not make antibodies, but they also recognize antigens and in this way, they alter their uh, uh, DNA. Uh, to recognize a particular antigen and they keep this in their memory. So there are uh, uh, differences in their in, in the different blood cells and uh, uh, and there is a very high degree of uh, differentiation in each of these cells as you have just examined. Um, so the question is, how does this um, high degree of uh, differentiation potential, how, how did they acquire this high degree of differentiation potential? How does these progenitors, what, what defines or what determines the, that these progenitors, they go into each of these particular cell types, differentiate into the, each of these particular cell types? So let's first uh, start with this experimental discovery where uh, the scientists have discovered that this bone marrow, uh, which I told you that that is the source of the blood stem or blood cells, that the transplant of this bone marrow, which has been uh, going on for many decades, uh, but people didn't know that how uh, this, this uh, bone marrow transplant worked until uh, not very recently. I mean, uh, like 10 or 20 years ago, they found out that there are stem cells in the bone marrow that actually when you uh, transplant them into a patient, 
uh, either their own bone marrow transplant or from a, a nearby relative, um, that transplant leads to the formation of blood cells. But this excellent experiment that demonstrated the ability of uh, stem cells uh, that give rise to uh, different types of blood cells came from this experiment where they uh, irradiated a mouse with very high dose of uh, gamma radiation. And can anybody tell me what happens if you give a very high dose of radiation to cells? What happens to the body or what happens to the cells if you give very high dose of radiation? Sharjil, are you there? Uh, yes, sir. Do you know what happens if you give a very high dose of uh, radiation to cells? Uh, so something happens. So what is the most important ingredient of the cell? What What is the most important molecule in the cell? DNA. DNA, yes. So something happens to DNA if you give a very high dose of energy. So radiation is energy. You give a very high energy to, to cells. What happens to DNA? Mutation, yes. Mutation, but a very specific kind of mutation. That is, there are the breaks arises. The DNA is broken down. If you give a very high dose of radiation, it breaks down the phosphodiester bond between the nucleotides and it, it breaks down. I mean, there are of course other mutations as well. There are, there is oxidative damage and so on and so forth. But the major or the most lethal damage that occurs after radiation is that the cells, they acquire uh, double strand breaks. And that is the most lethal damage that DNA can have. So uh, if you give a high dose of radiation to mouse cells, what happens is all its bone marrow dies its own bone marrow dies. So it cannot uh, remake its own blood cells. So now if you're in this irradiated mouse, if you transfuse uh, this mouse with a, a donor bone marrow, what happens is this uh, mouse starts making blood cells. And that was a landmark discovery, uh, which uh, basically uh, demonstrated that the bone marrow has stem cells. Because if it only has the, the differentiated cells, the differentiated cells, as we discussed yesterday, that they are end cells. They do not divide. For example, RBCs, they don't even have a nucleus. So they cannot divide. They, can, they are not uh, uh, maintainable in this way that they, they do not cycle as normal as, as the uh, cycling cells. So they don't have a kind of normal cell cycle. Um, all the most of the different uh, differentiated uh, cells are end cells, but the 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 bone marrow it contains some cells that had this uh, uh, potential to grow into to divide and sustain their own population, but also divide and differentiate into uh, progenitors first progenitors and then into differentiated cell types. So this mice uh, uh, was okay after this transplant and these uh, experiments uh, also showed that the, the bone marrow transplant can be used, exploited therapeutically uh, to treat blood diseases, especially cancers uh, and also some immunological disorders. And, there, and then there are also uh, other sources of uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells or stem cells, which we discussed earlier, for example, this umbilical cord uh, when the newborn babies, uh, in the newborn babies, they keep this portion of umbilical cord because it also has this uh, perinatal stem cells. So uh, then we consider the question, how does uh, this, these progenitors or this multipotent stem cells in the hematopoietic system, it um, is differentiated or, uh, into so many different types of cells. And the answer to this, that question is this uh, adult stem cells, they require a stem cell niche. And what do I mean by niche is that they require external support. I mean, they cannot uh, develop or differentiate into uh, specialized cell types on their own. 
they may be able to divide, but then even for their own division or for, for their own sustainability, for their own self-renewal potential, they need a stem cell niche. And that niche provides them with the transcription, with, with the growth factors and uh, even physical support in the form of meshwork uh, that is absolutely required for, uh, required for adult stem cell uh, renewal and adult stem cell uh, differentiation. And then there are, uh, yeah, I think we've gone past this question. So I had this question for you guys that how do stem cells manage to maintain their number while still giving rise to millions of circulating blood cells? And uh, I have just given the response to this question, but anybody, if you were listening, maybe you can jump in and give me the response. So how do stem cells manage to maintain their number? So you said that they require a stem cell niche, which gives them the Yes, support. but how do they maintain their own number? So they are they self-renew and they divide. So there is an, this is called asymmetric cell division. So normally when a cell divides, it gives two very identical daughter cells. But when a stem cell divides, it gives rise to, to, a, to unidentical cells. So one cell is uh, uh, one cell is similar to uh, its own. It's very similar to itself. And the other cell, it's a progenitor cell that uh, give, refer, give rise to further differentiated cell types. Mm -hmm. But then the question arises that what is behind this asymmetric cell division? And that is actually a central question, still a central question in developmental biology and differentiation studies. But there are then uh, different uh, suppositions or hypotheses around it and different people uh, have shown that at least there are two different mechanisms how uh, this asymmetric cell division is maintained. So one is one theory or let's say um, uh, people have shown that when a stem cell divides, it, it gives rise to two different cells and it gives, uh, which expresses different set of proteins. And that's in this way, and, but then the question arises, how, what specifies that these two cells express two different set of proteins? That's a separate question. The other thing that determines this asymmetry or that regulates or controls this asymmetry is the microenvironment. So when a stem cell divides, uh, uh, it uh, makes one of the cell that is of its own kind, which remains in its uh, very, close proximity and its own, uh, they have their own microenvironment. The other cell, it is then out of this niche and it, it goes out of this niche and it has a different set of microenvironment. And that's why it started differentiating. So when the cells in the bone marrow, this, uh, the stem cells, they give divide, they, um, uh, they start coming out of the, uh, of the bone marrow. And in that, that way, so they are exposed to a different set of signals. Uh, while the stem cell population itself, the self-renewing stem cell population, it remained in the bone marrow, and that's why it's uh, exposed to a different kind of microenvironment. So these are two different uh, hypotheses around why there is this, uh, why or how the stem cells maintain their asymmetry. Now let's uh, discuss about some of the niche factors. Um, so, 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 so the stem cell niche in the, bone, uh, in the bone marrow is provided by the bone marrow stromal cells. So there are uh, connective tissue cells, uh, for example, fibroblasts and some other cells that provides this bone marrow niche. And then there is this extracellular matrix that is bound by the stem cells. And all these, this microenvironment, it provides the stem cell niche. And then there are certain molecular factors, for example, uh, bone morphogenetic proteins or wind beta catenine signaling. Uh, these are required for keeping the stem cells stem cells. So they, uh, because they prevent them from differentiating. But when a cell decides to differentiate, then as I said, that it needs to come out of the niche. Um, yeah, 
So um, in the hematopoietic system, what people have observed is that there is very early commitment to erythroid and lymphoid lineages. And then as I have shown earlier, that um, if you go back here, as you can see that there is an early commitment to the uh, erythroid and lymphoid lineage, and then both of them uh, can give rise to the myeloid lineage. But of course there are uh, extracellular signals and that, are, that is also dependent on the physiological needs of the body. So for example, what would happen if you lose a lot of blood. So, anyone? What happens to the blood when you lose a lot of blood? So the signal goes to the bone marrow that there is a low blood volume and then stem cells, they start making more blood. Of course, it takes some time. It's not immediate, but uh, but you would be surprised at how quickly cells divide because every second, uh, the bone marrow produces 2 million blood cells. And that's an astonishing number because they need to maintain this 25 trillion blood cells in the blood. So, uh, so there are physiological needs, for example, uh, anybody tell me what happens when there is an infection, which type of cells they start growing? Hania Danish. Yeah. So what what happens when there is an infection? Which type of cell starts growing? The white blood cells. So, and it, then it depends on what kind of infection it is. If it's a viral infection, then a different set of uh, white blood cells started growing. If it's an acute infection, a different set, chronic infection, a different set, and parasites, a different uh, type of blood cells they started, uh, started increasing in number. So this uh, hematopoietic uh, uh, growth is also, I mean, it's, it, it's a normal physiological process, but it's also, dependent on the external needs of the body. So then the scientists were encountered with this uh, question that how do you experimentally identify individual lineages of hematopoietic stem cells? Because they are all growing in one big mix of blood and bone marrow. So this was actually resolved very uh, recently where Actually, the, the, this technique was developed single cell RNA-seq. And RNA sequencing is a way where you uh, basically analyze the transcriptome of the cell. So the RNA molecules and that tells you what kind of genes are expressed in a particular cell type. But what happens in a single cell RNA-seq is that you are able to identify individual population or individual cell so at each cell level, you can you are able to identify what kind of genes are expressed. And that tells you what kind of uh, uh, differentiated cell it is. Because if you, for example, look at the transcriptome in a pool of uh, cells, all if uh, you do the RNA-seq for all of these cells, you will get a bulk analysis or mixed analysis of mRNA population and mixed analysis of uh, mixed degree of gene expression, which will not tell you uh, the individual identities of these cells. But if you are able to, with a single cell RNA-seq, you're able to uh, identify each and every cell in, in the bone marrow or in the blood, wherever. And you can classify these cells into uh, individual differentiated types. And even though, and before this technique, uh, people have been looking at blood cells under microscope and um, uh, most of the uh, very similar looking cells, they, I mean, with this, uh, with the advent of this technique, scientists have found out that uh, even the very similar looking cells under microscope, they have a completely different uh, expression of RNA and a different uh, set of proteins are expressed. And in this way, they were able to uh, identify different subtypes. 
And that actually reminds us this Weddington's epigenetic or developmental landscape, which we discussed yesterday, is that there are these self-aid choices. And uh, if, when, if you start with a multipotent stem cell, it divides and then gives rise to um, semi-differentiated or fully differentiated cell types. It depends at each intersection point, it uh, encounters a different set of signals and it de decides whether it go on this road or on this road. And then this is a, uh, there is a, always a binary signal. And, um, and usually we also discussed yesterday that the fates are most of the times, or let's say 80% of the times, it's predetermined. So if a cell goes on this side or on this side or this side, it is already predetermined. And the cells usually do not deviate too much from this um, predetermination. And these are determined because uh, at this point, the cells encounter a different set of, or express a different set of, uh, a, a specific set of, or combination of transcription factors. And that determines what kind of uh, differentiated phenotype they are gonna adopt. So, um, uh, yeah, so hematopoietic system or uh, uh, this uh, developmental system, miniature developmental system, it is, um, it's kind of a hierarchical uh, system which depends on the uh, hierarchical expression of transcription factors. So at this point, at the early level, there are different set of transcription factors that are active and at every transaction, uh, 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 this uh, uh, bifurcation point, they encounter a different set of transcription factors and they go either this way or that way, depending on which transcription factors are expressing or which combination of transcription factors are, uh, are expressing. So just to give you an example. So in the, in the let's say, let's compare this um, uh, erythroid kind of branch of the, of the hematopoietic stem cell. So they have this uh, precursor, which then further differentiated into uh, megakaryocyte erythrocyte precursor or eosinophil mast cell precursor. So this is a uh, erythrocyte uh, or erythroid uh, branch, and this is the myeloid branch, sorry. So as you can see that the, then there is a balance between two different transcription factors. So if there is an increase in GATA1 transcription factor, the cell goes to uh, the erythroid branch of the maturation, which gives rise to erythrocytes and megakaryocytes, which give rise to platelets. But if there is a, an increase in uh, PU1 transcription factor, then it goes into the myeloid branch of the differentiation. And then there are of course other factors, but the ma mainly these two factors, they counteract each other. It's not that they are completely downregulated in one or the other. It's always the balance between them that dictates which of the uh, differentiating cell line they're gonna follow. And then, yes, yes. So these uh, PU1 and uh, GATA1, these are stem, examples of stem cell niches? Um, well, you can say that because it's uh, not, not really, actually, no. Stem cell niche works above this. So this is already a predetermined progenitor cell. So stem cell niche, we discussed about stem cell niche. That is, yeah, I think uh, I should remove this, sorry for that. Uh, so now we are talking a little bit downstream of the stem cell niche because the niche is concerned only with the stem cells. Now we're talking about the progenitors. So this is a further step down. And these uh, uh, transcription factors, they are only expressed in the early progenitors of the hematopoietic stem cell. And then, uh, so apart from these transcription factors, there are also these growth factors. So, uh, which are hematopoietic growth factors. And then there is a specific combination of hematopoietic growth factors. So growth factors, they are uh, extracellular molecules or they are uh, 
secreted in extracellular matrix and then they bind to the cell surface receptors. Uh, so transcription factors, they are inside the cell and growth factors, they actually act from outside the cell. And then, so if you consider these two examples, the difference between neutrophils and monocytes microphages, I mean, both of them, they are from myeloid branch uh, of the white blood of the white blood cells or the blood cells. And they are, uh, the progenitor uh, are the same, but then uh, down the way, down the road in the, during the differentiation, they have uh, a different set of uh, uh, growth factors. So for example, for neutrophils, you have granulocyte colony uh, stimulation factor. And then in the uh, uh, monocytes macrophages, you have a monocyte colony stimulating factor. And then both of them, they have this uh, granulocyte, monocyte, uh, colony stimulating factor and I interleukin-3. But there are, there are subtle differences in the growth factors which further differentiate these cells into neutrophils and monocytes. And what determines which growth factor binds to these cells or differentiate into that the progenitors are differentiated into neutrophils and which uh, differentiate into monocytes, it's they're also cell surface receptors. So the cell surface, some, some of these cells, they express the cell surface receptor for the granulocyte CSF. And some of these cells they express the cell surface receptor for monocyte CSF. And that determines that they bind to this growth factor and they bind to this growth factor. Um, but having said that, the differentiation into a particular cell type is a chance event because how would you, uh, how, how does the cells decide which path they, they, they want to follow? But like I said that it was um, experimentally discovered that if you take uh, a stem cell and uh, let it divide into two daughter cells and then take out these two daughter cells, grow them, in, uh, in laboratory, in uh, experimental setting. 80% of the time, they grow into uh, what you expect them to grow into, both of these daughter cells. So you give them the same uh, growth conditions. Uh, for example, you take uh, one of these cells and give them a granulocyte colony stimulating factor. So 80% of the time, the one of the daughter cells or both of, or both of the daughter cells, they will differentiate into neutrophils. But yet 20% of the times they will grow into monocytes. And we still don't know why this happens. So that's why uh, it's said that differentiation into a particular uh, cell type, it may be a chance even, but it's also possible that we do not completely comprehend what is happening there. So uh, having uh, um, discussed this hematopoietic stem cells or stem hematopoietic uh, differentiation system, which is the most widely studied uh, differentiation system in mammals. And uh, so we will now consider one particular cell type and, how, and, and we will see how its uh, differentiation is established and at the molecular kind of level. And we, um, look at the erythrocytes. So erythrocytes are the red blood cells. And as we've discussed earlier that they do, they have enucleated uh, at the final level stages of differentiation. So they uh, remove their nucleus uh, in mammals, but in birds, they still have the nucleus, but uh, it's transcriptionally inactive. So, um, in the vertebrates, this uh, identity of red blood cells is determined by this hemoglobin. So anybody can tell me what hemoglobin is? Quickly, quickly guys, don't have a lot of time I have to cover a lot. It's a very simple question. It's a protein. Yeah, yeah, but what, what does it do? So the heme group, it... Uh... The iron in it, it binds to the oxygen. Okay. And it, it is required for oxidative phosphorylation. So 
if uh, so the red blood cells are very critical in the energy uh, production in this in the in the body so if there is a um, reduction in red blood cells that means that there is a reduction in hemoglobin that leads to uh, a lot of problems in the energy uh, production of the of the body and all tissues they suffer especially brain tissue so um, uh, and hemoglobin so apart from heme heme it's a uh, it's basically uh, iron and uh, we're not talking about that so we're talking about the protein component of the hemoglobin so the globin part and globin uh, in mammals uh, in uh, vertebrates it is uh, encoded by uh, two different clusters of genes so the alpha globin genes and the beta globin genes and uh, they are expressed uh, at, uh, through different promoters or different set of these genes expressed during different stages of development so in embryo you have a different set of globin genes in fetus you have a different set of globin genes in adults you have a different set of globin genes and this um, remarkable diversity is maintained by uh, some Mm, uh, three-dimensional mechanisms that we also uh, learned yesterday from Wendy Bickmore's lecture. I don't know how many of you were present there, but that was a really uh, wonderful lecture and to understand how there is this uh, remarkable three-dimensional capability of the genome to fold and uh, to itself and regulate different functions. Uh, so, and this is very nicely demonstrated in the expression of the beta globin gene. So just to give you an example, so we're, con we're gonna consider the beta globin gene and it has uh, some regulatory regions and then it has a cluster of five genes and uh, different genes express. So epsilon gene expressed during embryo, embryonic development, and then in fetus, late embryonic stages, or fetal stages, then you have gamma, alpha and gamma, and then you have uh, beta and delta, they express during the adult life. The question is, how do cells organize uh, the expression or regulate the expression of different genes or in this cluster? So uh, uh, this is the regulatory region and we discussed about it and day before yesterday in the last lecture that regulatory regions are absolutely important for the expression of the gene. So if you remove the regulatory region, the gene itself will not express, although there is no change in the gene sequence at all. So and if you change, if you put a uh, promoter of one set of gene next to another set of gene, the, which is repressed, for example, uh, it starts transcribing because of the effect of this promoter. And if you put, uh, for example, um, uh, elastase one promoter in next to the growth hormone gene, which we also learned in the last lecture, then the growth hormone uh, uh, gene starts expressing in the pancreas because elastase one uh, transcription factors are present in the pancreas. So uh, regulatory regions, they have a very important role in uh, regulating uh, the gene expression. But here, the remarkable thing is that the regulatory regions, this uh, locus control regions, beta locus control regions, they are quite far away from, um, from the actual gene itself. So you can also consider them as enhancers. So generally the promoters are next to the genes, but then you have some other controlled regulatory regions that are far away, but they still exert their, their uh, control, their action on the genes. And you can appreciate it by this uh, picture, by this three-dimensional folding of the chromatin that, so during the early embryonic life, what happens is this locus controlled region it uh, the chromatin is folded in a way that only the epsilon gene is in proximity to the locus control region so that all this multi-protein complex initiation factors they come in contact with the, uh, both the lcr and the gene itself and in this way uh, only the epsilon gene is uh, expressing uh, and then there is a switch in the gene folding pattern and then you can see that in the uh, later fetal life, uh, there is a uh, 
different kind of chromatin conformation or chromatin structure, which makes this, uh, which creates this gamma genes in proximity to the locus control region. And then in the adult bone marrow, there is uh, again a rearrangement in the chromatin structure, which brings on the beta uh, gene, beta globin gene, uh, next to the proximity of this locus control region. So this uh, this example, this is a prime example which is very uh, widely studied, and uh, at least in this example, uh, there is this uh, very uh, important impact of the chromatin looping on the gene expression program. Uh, but this is not always the case, as you have also seen yesterday, or some of you have seen yesterday that Wendy Bickmore was telling about the sonic hedgehog uh, gene. So when they uh, changed the uh, topological domains, what happens is there was no impact on the gene expression pattern. So not all genes are created equal or not all genes are regulated. I mean, at least this tells us that not all genes are regulated in this fashion. Uh, and there are maybe more important cis acting factors on the gene promoter uh, or nearby, uh, which are probably more important for its regulation, for its expression. But at least uh, in this beta globin gene, the, the, the impact of chromatin looping and chromatin three-dimensional structure is really evident. Uh, and uh, also a relevant question here is that why do cells need different uh, type of these genes or different type of beta globin genes or globin genes in fetal life, in uh, embryonic life, in adult life? So the answer is there are different oxygen requirements in different uh, stages of life. So, uh, and also there's a different mode of oxygen transport. So in um, fetal life or an early embryonic life, there is this uh, placenta, which has oxygen diffused in uh, liquid and um, in blood. And that's where the red blood cells, they acquire or hemoglobin, uh, it acquires oxygen. In the adult life, you have a relatively, so, so you need very high affinity uh, uh, globin uh, molecule that has a very high, extremely high affinity for oxygen. Uh, but in case of adult life, you have a very high concentration of oxygen in the lungs and it's relatively easier for red blood cells or the blood cells to acquire uh, this uh, oxygen molecule. So that's, uh, so the beta globin gene in adults, it has a relatively lesser affinity for oxygen. So it, it, it depends on um, the requirements of the body and that's how the body switches from one gene to another gene. Um, there are subtle differences in the gene sequence which makes them more or less sensitive to oxygen. Um, have you heard of sickle cell disease? Okay, we can consider it a little bit later. Um, yeah. So let's move on to another type of tissue that is uh, constantly renewed. And uh, so let me ask this question. So you have this skin. So why does, uh, sorry. So the question is, why does epidermal layer of skin needs constant renewal? It is exposed to a very harsh external environment and there's a continuous loss of cells from its surface. And that's why it, is, it needs constant renewal. Um, but then the question arises, why does blood cells need constant renewal? What, what happens to the red blood cells, for example? Why, why do they need constant renewal? Anyone can tell me? So what happens to the blood cells? Why there is a continuously uh, bone marrow supply of blood cells? Ms. Ba?
uh, said they don't have nucleus. That's why they. Uh, yeah. Replicate. Good. 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 So red blood cells. In case of red blood cells, yes, you are right. They don't have nucleus, so they need to be renewed. So whatever proteins they have made. It's gonna. It's not gonna last forever. It, they are going to be degraded. And the most important protein that that they have and that needs renewal is this um, sodium potassium ATPase pump. And that's absolutely required to uh, pump out uh, together with sodium. It pumps out water out of the red blood cells, and that gives rise to this uh, bike and cave uh, shape of the red blood cells. Um, and that uh, actually pump is extremely important because if the uh, red blood cells, they do not have this bike and cave disc shape, what happens is when they go through very narrow blood vessels, they are not, uh, I mean, this, this bike and cave disc shape, it gives them this flexibility that will help them go through the very narrow blood capillaries. And if, they, if the sodium potassium pump, uh, ATPS pump is not working, it's degraded or it's uh, not functional properly, what happens is you have this, um, uh, uh, you have accumulation of water in the cell and this, uh, in the red blood cells, and they do not have, they are more plump. And when they go through the narrow blood vessels, they are blocked there, they get ruptured and they're destroyed. So it's very important that the red blood cells maintain this ATP, ATPS channel. So, uh, so what happens is after certain days or certain months, the ATPS pump stops functioning because it requires ATP. And it, there is also a limited supply of ATP in the, uh, uh, in the red blood cells. And after that supply got uh, worn off, then what happens is this ATPS pump doesn't work. The cell, red blood cells start swelling up and then they go through the very narrow spleen channels. They get just destroyed. And this happens every uh, three to four months. So it's the, their life is about 120 days. So that's why uh, the blood cells uh, needs renewal. And then uh, similarly for the other uh, blood cells, there are different mechanisms how, and, but they are, we continuously lose the, the blood cells and that's why we need a continuous renewal. And same is the case for uh, your uh, uh, epidermal layer. So epidermis is renewed every four weeks and this is a general structure of your skin. So what you see here is that you have a connective tissue base and then you have this, uh, above this red line, you have the epithelial layer. And on the top, you have um, uh, this um, cornified uh, layer of uh, dead cells, basically. And um, this is a very nice system because it also gives you an idea of this hierarchical differentiation of cells. So in epithelium, what happens is you have a basal layer and below this basal layer, you have this basement membrane, which is a fibrous layer of uh, uh, it's a collagenous and laminin layer, uh, which supports the basal layer of cells. And this basement membrane together with the connective tissue in the gray, it provides the niche for uh, the stem cells that are present at the base of this uh, epithelial lining. Uh, so the red cells here, you can you see here, they are the, uh, skin stem cells, let's say. So, uh, and the niche is provided by the basement membrane and the connective tissue, fibroblasts in the connective tissue. And as we discussed earlier, that the niche is required for stem cell renewal. And uh, so stem cells keep their own population and keep them, it also keeps them undifferentiated. Uh, so, but what happens is you uh, have a basal layer of cells and then the differentiation process, it, it's a continuous process. So all the time you have, since we, we uh, uh, saw on the previous slide that there's constant removal of the top layer because the skin is exposed to very harsh environment. And um, so it needs to be replaced from the cells from the bottom. So there's a constant uh, growth of uh, stem, uh, uh, growth from the stem cells, which uh, then goes up and up and then they finally become dead and on the surface layer. And then finally they shed off. And uh, there are different signals that are required for uh, each of these layers. And uh, we can consider them. 
here. So this is the basal layer and this, these, this layer expresses keratin 5 and 14. But then when the signal comes in, so they uh, need to express, uh, they switch their expression from keratin 5 to 14 to 1 and 10. And this way, they start detaching from the basement membrane and uh, start changing their shape as well. And uh, of course, there are these uh, same factors. So for example, the bone morphogenetic protein factors that inhibit the differentiation and also wind signaling uh, that inhibits the basal, cell, basal layer differentiation. And then you have um, EGFR activity uh, that then starts uh, you know, pushing the cells for differentiation. So there, there is a combination of different factors or different proteins that uh, either maintain the stem cell population or it uh, favors the differentiation. Uh, but what happens is, uh, imagine if you have, uh, so there are uh, different proteins that forms the junction uh, together with the basement membrane. And um, uh, so in the epithelium, they are called hemidesmosomes. So this attachment is called hemidesmosome. And uh, there are different proteins uh, that are responsible for this attachment. And if, there, if something happens and the, if there's a mutation in these genes, then you have, <coughs> sorry, then you have a detachment of this basal layer from the basement membrane. And this is uh, what happens when you have blisters on your skin. You, everybody has experienced blisters on the skin, which is basically a detachment of this epithelial layer from the basement membrane, from the connective tissue underneath. And then there are different diseases uh, associated with this. So this epidermolysis bullosa, in which there is a mutation in uh, keratin type five, I think. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a disease where the base, basal layer is not properly anchored. And I'm giving you this example because um, uh, this is what I'm gonna come to that now. So there, there was a, an extreme case of this uh, junctional epidermolysis bullosa. And uh, there was a small kid who had uh, blistering on 80% of the skin. And uh, what scientists did was they take a patch, take out a patch of his skin which was a defective skin. And then they corrected the mutation. They found out that there was a mutation in this LAM3 gene. So it's laminin uh, B3 gene. And, um, and this is part of this um, uh, hemidesmosome. So it, it's part of the uh, gluing apparatus that glues this basement membrane to, uh, to the cells. So if you have a problem or a mutation in this uh, gluing apparatus, then what happens is you have uh, blistering all over the body. And this guy has an unfortunate uh, mutation uh, and he has this uh, blistering on 80% of his body. So the scientists, they took out epidermal cells, isolated epidermal cells from this patient and then they corrected this gene by retroviral vectors. Uh, we will discuss it uh, later how this happens, but uh, just to give you a brief introduction. So you can clone in any gene in the retroviral vectors and then expose the cells or the target cells with this uh, cloned retroviral vector, which has your gene of interest. Uh, and when you infect these cells, the virus goes inside these cells and it gets integrated into the, into the genome of the host cell. And so what scientists did was they corrected this mutation. So they put a normal copy of the gene. Um, and uh, so this gene gets incorporated in, and every cell receives different number of viruses, which, uh, so it means that they, every cell receives a different uh, number of copies of this gene. So normally we have two copies of each gene, uh, but in this case, when you uh, trans, or when you uh, transduce cells with viruses, you get multiple copies of the gene. Um, and then they uh, let the cells grow into colonies. So each cell was a clone of a single cell. So they uh, grew these cells into colonies. So it means that each cell was a clonal amplification of, uh, of one cell 
uh, each uh, colony is a clonal amplification of one cell. And which means that they have a different number of genes supplied, or as I uh, said earlier, that when you transduce uh, cells with a virus, you get different number of copies of the virus into each cell. And which means that you have different number of copies of, uh, of that gene in each cell. And if you grow these cells in clonal population, then you get a different uh, clones which expresses different levels of these of this gene and this is uh, demonstrated here by the different colors and then what they did is they uh, grew these cells in the laboratory and um, into layers into monolayers and then they patched them onto the boy's skin and 8 months later uh, most of the clones they died out but then some of them survived and then uh, he was, he, the, the guy survived. And uh, that was a remarkable experiment. And that was a therapeutically uh, kind of very uh, remarkable thing at that time. And uh, this, what does this tell us? This example basically illustrates that there, there were kind of in these epidermis, there were some stem cells or some um, uh, multipotent cells that when received this normal copy of the gene, they grew into the normal epithelium or they, they grew, they grew into, uh, so they, they clonically, clonally amplified. And when they, when the doctors put these patches on the skin of the boy, they started growing as an epithelium and they covered the whole body. Uh, so basically, it's an example of a tissue engineering. And uh, although they, I mean, this guy was lucky because he didn't have side effects from the uh, retroviral introduction, because as we will also consider later that there are a lot of potential problems with the viral transduction. And one of the major problems is that you cannot control, or at least in this experiment, they did not control where exactly the virus is gonna integrate into the genome. So if it, it gets in, integrated into an important point or inside a gene, it can also create a lot of mutations itself just by integrating it in di at different sites. So, uh, but at least um, uh, this guy got this treatment and uh, he, this skin was grown from genetically corrected stem cells. And that was a remarkable thing. Um, okay, so then we, let's, uh, yeah, okay, let's take a five minutes break now, and then we resume at 11.15, uh, and then we will have 45 minutes, and we will try to finish up. Okay, let's uh, get back at 11.15. All right, guys, let's start again. So, so we were, we were considering, so we just finished with the, uh, we, we just saw how the epithelial layer from the skin, it can be grown uh, because of the stem cells present. And now we will consider uh, another type of cells that needs constant renewal. And that's the lining of the gut. And again, it is exposed to a lot of harmful or um, very excessive use and some uh, kind of, it's, an, it's a harsh environment. And that's why there is a constant shedding of cells from the surface of this uh, epithelial lining of the gut. And it needs constant renewal. And uh, there is a, so there is a uh, big difference between the epithelium at the skin and epithelium in, in this, uh, epi uh, the, the gut epithelium, is that in this gut epithelium, you have only a single layer of cells. Um, yeah, so, uh, and this single layer of cells, it has, it is folded into 
two shapes. So it, it forms these uh, villi. So there are extensions of the connective tissue into the lumen of the, uh, of the gut. And then there are these crypts that goes inside uh, the connective tissue. So, and um, there is a, uh, experiments have shown that there is a quite high degree of uh, uh, proliferative activity inside these scripts. And then which led to the discovery of multiple different cell types in, in these scripts, um, which actually I'm gonna so go in detail now. So uh, in the villi, it's very simple. So there is a growing population of cells that comes from the bottom of the crypt into the uh, out of the crypt and then goes onto this villi. And then this is the surface of the villi that is exposed to, most exposed to the uh, harsh environment. And then the cells get shed out off from the surface layer. And uh, so what, but what is happening inside this uh, crypt? Um, so there are these three different types of cells that are present in this crypt. And this is also the bottom of the crypt is, is the uh, stem cell niche for the crypt. And this um, niche, it is comprised of uh, uh, this uh, connective tissue and the panet cell. Uh, so there are four types of cells in this crypt. So one of them is uh, the panet cell. And this panet cell, basically it, um, it has also has a function as a stem cell niche, but it, it, it also excretes the antimicrobial pep peptides. And then you have a um, uh, goblet cell, for example, here you can see that there is a goblet cell, uh, which actually secretes mucus that uh, bathes this uh, villus and the uh, inside of the gut. Uh, and then you have enteroendocrine cells that, uh, so this is the enteroendocrine cell. Uh, it secretes different, as the name indicates, the endocrine, it secretes different hormones. And then you have the enterocyte. And enterocyte is uh, the major cell that actually, uh, so what is the function of the, uh, of the intestine, of this epithelium? What happens there? Anyone can tell me? Amna Mehfuz. So what happens um, at this intersection, at this level, at the intestine? There's a very important function that is happening there for the body. In the absorption of digestion. Absorbed yeah. food, exactly, very good. So, and this is the cell, this enterocyte is the cell in this uh, population of cells that actually uh, absorbs nutrients. And I mean, all these cells, they are kind, mostly they are enterocytes. And their main function is to absorb nutrients from mm, whatever you have in this uh, part of the intestine. Uh, and there's a very high degree of, as I said earlier, high proliferative activity uh, there uh, in the crypts uh, and every four days, this epithelium gets renewed. So you can imagine the level of proliferative activity there. Um, excuse me, could you yes. please repeat what part exactly is the uh, part of the niche? So the, the niche is only this part. So you see this uh, red lining here. So this is kind of a basement membrane, but it's a, protect, it's a fibrous layer and then the penet cell. So the penet cell and the, this uh, lining here and this red lining here, basically the red things are the stem cell, red and the, the, the green. They, these, this is the stem cell niche. And this, uh, and there are two different type of, or maybe three different type of stem cells here. So one is uh, slow dividing and it expresses the BMI1 and uh, a component of uh, polycom complex, so uh, PRC1 complex. And then you have this frequently dividing LRG5 expressing, which is a GPCR. Uh, and uh, then you have very slow cyclic that expresses both of them. So this is just their uh, 
kind of markers that led them to identify, let scientists identify them. So there, there, there are three types of stem cells here and they are supported by Pennet cell and uh, this, uh, this fibrous layer, their connective tissue at the bottom. Um, yeah. And similar to the epithelial lining, so there are these, uh, the same factors that um, basically support the stem cell niche or the prevent the differentiation of stem cells. They are active in both uh, epidermis and the intestinal epithelium. So for example, there's this uh, bone morphogenetic protein that prevents stem cell differentiation uh, and uh, wind signaling that promotes the um, uh, survival or the growth of the stem cell and sustain the self renewal uh, nature of the stem cell. And similarly here as well. So the, in the, um, there is an inhibitory signal from BMP uh, that prevents the um, differentiation of stem cell. And then you have uh, uh, noggin gremlin that uh, basically inhibits BMP so that it, so the stem cell starts uh, differentiating. And as I explained earlier, there is this, these things are not in absolute terms. So there is always a balance that is maintained between different factors. That's the most important concept that you need to understand. That in the cells, there's always a competition. And uh, it's cells always maintain the balance. And that balance is determined by uh, then extracellular factors, for example, or the physiological pressures. Uh, for example, in case of blood cells, if there is a need to develop, uh, to, to, uh, if there is a need, if, if you lose a lot of blood, for example, then there is a physiological need to uh, uh, make more blood. And that's when the balance uh, is shifted towards producing more progenitors. Uh, so, and if there is no physiological need, then the balance is towards uh, maintenance of the stem cell population. So it, there is always a balance between different factors. Um, yeah. So then we consider so the, uh, there are certain tissues in the body that are in constant renewal, and we have seen three or three or four of them. So, for example, uh, blood cells that needs constant renewal. Then you have uh, skin epidermis that needs constant renewal, and together with skin epidermis, you have hair follicle that also. Uh, I think we didn't discuss it, but the cells here, for example, in the hair follicle bulge, they are also stem cells, and it has been shown that they have been used uh, to grow uh, the whole epidermis as well, just like these red cells here. So, uh, and this is the sebaceous gland. Um, so, uh, so you have hematopoietic stem, stem cells or hematopoietic system that needs constant uh, renewal. You have epidermis that needs constant renewal. You have these uh, hair follicle that needs constant renewal. Then you have gut epithelium that needs constant renewal. Um, so these are at least the four uh, different types of uh, tissues that are constantly producing new cells. And um, this is also kind of in a way important. Uh, okay, let me ask you a question. You must have heard that in cancer patients, they, as a part of the treatment, they get radiation therapy. And we discussed earlier that what radiation does. But you have observed that a lot of those patients who received either radiation or a chemotherapy, a treatment for the cytotoxic treatment, they always have, for example, they lose their hair, they uh, have problems in their gut, or they have, uh, for example, diarrhea or digestive tract problems, and they have skin problems. And you can relate those problems with, with the information that you have just learned today. So why, there is, why they have these problems? So when cancer patients, they get these drugs which are cytotoxic drugs. So what, the way these drugs function is that they kill all the cycling cells. 
and these are the only let's say major four types of cycling cells so hematopoietic cells uh, skin cells hair follicle cells and uh, gut epithelial cells these are the four cells that are constantly cycling and we've just seen that there is a uh, three months or four months time for blood renewal there is a four weeks time for um, uh, skin re renewal and there's a four days time for gut epithelial renewal. So you, you can imagine that the level of uh, proliferative activity or cell cycling in these sites. So these are the sites that are most affected uh, when the cancer patients, they get this treatment, uh, cytotoxic treatment, either radiation therapy or um, uh, chemotherapy. And that's why they have these uh, symptoms. They, they have these signs that they lose their hair, they have skin problems and they have digestive tract problems. Um, and th that's, this is also one of the reasons why the chemotherapy or radiation therapy is given in intervals. So you have cycles of chemotherapy. So you give uh, treatment to cancer patients for two months, but then you have to stop. And you have to stop because you want to give these uh, stem cells at these four locations to renew the tissues that are destroyed by the chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy, of course, it's intended to kill the tumor, which is also cycling. I mean, the, so the tumor cells, they, are, they also have a very high proliferative activity. But so far, most of the chemotherapeutic drugs or the radiation therapy, they are not uh, specific enough to kill only the cancer cells that are cycling. So when you give the patient a chemotherapy or radiotherapy, it also kills the normally cycling cells as well. And these are the four cell types that are mostly affected. Okay. Um, Having said that, so, but we also learned earlier that there is a, so nature has given this potential in every tissue that there are stem cells that are present uh, in every tissue of the body. Although we are unable to identify maybe or isolate uh, these stem cells from most of the tissues, but, um, uh, but they, they, are, they are present there. Uh, so for example, uh, we've learned earlier or also in the previous lecture that how skeletal muscles uh, are differentiated uh, from this myOD group of uh, family of transcription factors. And then the most important uh, uh, signal that is required for the differentiation of skeletal muscle is their uh, retrieval from the cell cycle. So you have to inhibit the cell cycle or DNA replication in order for them to uh, start uh, differentiating. Um, but the question is, if, um, and we also asked this question last time, that if the differentiation is an embryonic process, but we have seen quite a few examples that in adult life, the differentiation is constantly ha happening. Now, the question is, if we can renew skeletal muscles from the, or neural cells from the stem cells, and the short answer is yes, but there's a big but here that this is not easy. It's a, it's a very uh, challenging task and more so for the neural cells. It's not easy to, uh, 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 to activate the neural stem cells, but there are observations that tells us that they are present. Um, and there, there is a, that there is a, there, uh, there, there is a, proliferative activity that is going on in the central nervous system, for example, in the brain, and new cells are constantly forming. Uh, and in case of uh, muscle cells, uh, there are these satellite cells that express uh, cell surface receptor CD34 and PEX7 uh, transcription factor, and um, under favorable conditions, even a one muscle fiber can grow into a whole um, um, uh, kind of the whole muscle cell, which is a multinuclear differentiated muscle cell. Um, yeah, and this was also actually shown uh, by a very ingenious experiment and where uh, scientists take out one satellite cell uh, in, uh, in mice and then they irradiate the mice again as before to kill all the uh, muscle stem cell population and then they put this one satellite cell uh, which led to the proliferation and development of the whole muscle fiber. 
so and of course there are these epigenetic mechanisms that are being active when the muscle cells uh, muscle uh, stem cells or these satellite cells they start differentiating all right so uh, for the neural uh, stem cells the direct evidence or the laboratory evidence is very scarce so it's not a easy easy task to do but um, that the adult stem cells are present but their presence is known but it's um, difficult to demonstrate it in individual cases but yeah so it, it's a challenging task okay then then finally we will consider the um, uh, different types of embryonic stem cells and let's first start with the differences between adult and embryonic stem cells so we discussed uh, earlier that the major there are two major differences so the adult stem cells they are multipotent and embryonic stem cells they are pluripotent and the second major difference is that adult stem cells they always require a niche and that niche comes usually from the bone marrow in, in, for example, in the hematopoietic cells, it comes from the bone marrow stroma, and in epithelium, it comes from basement membrane. So basically, it always comes from the connective tissue that, or the envi micro environment that the stem cells are embedded in. So this niche is very important for adult stem cells. So they are not able to survive on their own. They need something. While on the other hand, embryonic stem cells, they do not require a niche. So they are able to, um, they are self-sufficient. They can differentiate into they are pluripotent. They can differentiate into all three germ layers, and uh, they they are not dependent on niche vectors. Um, yeah. So here uh, I'm gonna start explaining you this. Um, is there the induced pluripotent? Yeah. In 2012, two guys were awarded Nobel Prize for physiology and medicine. And what they did was they, um, and we will also discuss it in the next uh, part of the lecture. I will briefly mention it here. They identified the four transcription factors that are required actually and it's really astonishing that so little is required to uh, make any cell a stem cell so if you uh, start expressing these four transcription factors so nano oct4 sox2 klf4 together with so it's a choice between nano and oct4 so either one of these and then sox2 klf4 together with cmic so these four transcription factors, if you express them in any differentiated cell, this differentiated cell, it becomes a stem cell. So it loses its differentiation status. So that's a very remarkable thing. And these guys, they received a Nobel Prize. So you can imagine the level of discovery it, it was. Um, and actually, so these factors, they are named after one of those guys. So uh, one of them was from Japan. and. Uh, uh, his name was Shinya Yamanaka. So these uh, uh, factors are known as Yamanaka factors. So OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and CMIC. Okay, so now, now consider um, the embryonic stem cells. Uh, I told you that they are different from adult stem cells in a way that they are pluripotent and they do not require a niche. And uh, the question is, can you grow them in laboratory in controlled settings? And the answer is yes. So uh, if you take out embryonic stem cells from the blastocyst, so which is four and a half days old embryo, you take out these uh, blue cells and you put them into a petri dish and you supply uh, serum with uh, this LIF protein. And um, what happens is that they continue to grow. 
And as we know that previously we have seen that BMP, so the bone morphogenetic protein, uh, this is required for um, uh, inhibition of, or this is required for the maintenance of stem cell population. So it inhibits the differentiation. So as long as you keep the serum, uh, which contains BMP, these cells are not gonna uh, uh, differentiate. So they will keep as the mouse embryonic stem cells in the Petri dish. And the remarkable thing is that if you now, after growing them into the petri plate in, as a monolayer, and then you take out these cells and put them back into a blastocyst of a different mouse, uh, or even a different strain of mouse, they can grow into a normal uh, mouse. And uh, so that's basically showing that they have this uh, uh, potential to uh, differentiate into all cell types because then they, they can, can contribute to an organism even though they were grown in, uh, in a petri dish. Uh, and that's, that's what chimeras are called. So if you take out, if you take the um, epiblast cells or the embryonic stem cells from one embryo, grow it outside in a petri dish and then transplant into another uh, blastocyst, uh, that is called the chimera. And of course, Chimera, you cannot do this experiment with human embryos because of ethical concerns and moral issues. We will discuss them in the next part. Um, but the important thing is that you need the different set of uh, uh, transcription factors and growth factors in order to maintain this uh, stem cell population. And which was actually surprisingly, it's different for mouse and human. So in human, you need this fibroblast growth factor and active and nodal. And in uh, mouse, you need the serum, BM, you need BMP and lip. Um, and the human ES cells, they are taken from the blastocyst at five days old blastocyst. They, so one difference is that they require a different set of growth factors. So they require different signals. But um, the second difference is that these cells are not pluripotent. So the human ES cells, they are not pluripotent. And the reason is, the reason was understood by uh, later on when people have uh, identified this mouse epiblast stem cells. So this is half a day old embryo. Uh, half a day older than the blastocyst. And when the epiblasts were taken out from this uh, post-implantation embryo, so these are the two different stages of embryonic development. This is pre-implantation, this is post-implantation. So when it is embedded into the uh, placenta, I mean, it started making placenta and embedded into the uh, uterus. So uh, at this time, even the mouse embryo it requires the fibroblast growth factor. And the human embryo, it, I mean, very similar to the human embryo. Uh, and again, on the pluripotency, it's also kind of a multipotent. So as in humans, which can differentiate into a wide range of cell types, but not all, this epiblast, the mouse epiblast stem cells, they can also differentiate into wide range, but not all. And uh, in all the three cases, and importantly, this cannot co contribute to chimera. So if you put them in another mouse, they will not grow into uh, a mouse. In, into another embryo, it will not grow into an organism, into a mouse. But of course, this kind of experiment cannot be performed in humans. So we don't know if the human embryonic stem cells are uh, contribute to chimeras or not. Most likely not, uh, because they are very similar to the mouse epiplast stem cells. Anyway, so you, you see this word teratoma here. And uh, basically, yeah, the problem with this uh, embryonic stem cells uh, for their use as a therapeutic or for uh, mainly for therapeutic purposes is prohibited because they, it has been shown in, in mice that uh, if you, for example, if you uh, put these embryonic, mouse embryonic stem cells into uh, a developing embryo, 
it normally develops as a mouse. But if you put these cells in a uh, in an adult mouse under the skin, for example, it develops into tumors, and these are called teratomas, and they can be benign or uh, uh, malignant. And they have all the three germ layers. So because the mouse embryonic stem cells, they can differentiate into any cell type. So this uh, teratoma, and in humans, uh, it can also lead to teratomas. If you put uh, embryo human embryonic stem cells, it can also make teratomas. So that's a very important consideration when you want to use stem cells for therapeutic purposes. All right, so yeah. So in this lecture, what we have observed is that the differentiation is controlled by a complex combination of transcription factors that define a particular cell type, which we have seen in case of, very nicely observed in case of uh, hematopoietic uh, differentiation. Then we have seen that in case of globin uh, gene regulation, we've seen that the 3D structure of chromatin governed by epigenetic modifications is key to regulate gene expression during differentiation. And then later on, we saw different examples of how different adult tissues are continuously being replaced by differentiation of new cells uh, from a stem cell pool. Um, and we saw the differences between uh, adult stem cells and uh, uh, embryonic stem cells in that the adult stem cells, they require stem cell niche and they are multipotent, they are not pluripotent. In case of uh, embryonic stem cells, they do not require a niche, stem cell niche, and they are pluripotent, um, especially the mouse stem cells. And uh, yeah, and then, yeah, I think today it's uh, enough for today. And uh, in the next lecture, we will consider the plasticity of the differentiated state or how we can de-differentiate different mechanisms or different um, uh, steps that we can take or different procedures that we can adopt to de-differentiate de uh, the differentiated cells or the end cells and make them stem cells in order to use them for uh, studying disease or for even for therapeutic purposes. Um, and that's basically, and that actually is very interesting because it tells you that this uh, differentiation is not a permanent phenomenon, which we also discussed uh, in the last lecture that it's a very dynamic uh, thing because all the cells still maintain the same genome. It's just that there's some part of part, parts of the genome, they are repressed, so they're, they are not expressing. And in differentiated cells, only a small part of the genome is expressing that is required for the function of that cell. Uh, but as we've seen today that the, by the expression of these Yamanaka factors, so these four transcription factors, you can uh, de-differentiate, so you can induce uh, the stem cells in any differentiated cell population. So we'll consider this plasticity next time. Okay, all right. Any questions, guys? Um, yes, sir. I have a few. Sir, I have a few unrelated yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask about the skeletal cells. Okay, sir. So mm -hmm. You know how people say that hum, jo muscles banane wali hoti, so how is that related to this? Like if you're saying it, it's not possible. So what, uh -huh. what do they say that? Uh, okay, so I'm not saying that it's not possible to regenerate muscle. It's not easy to harness this. This is one thing. The other thing is with your muscle banane wali cheez hoti, so what you can do with the adult muscle tissue is that you can increase its size. It has a lot of potential to change size. So you can increase the thickness of the muscle fiber. And that is simply by adding more myosin or uh, all these uh, proteins that are actin and myosin and these skeletal, uh, cytoskeletal proteins that are accumulated into the muscle fiber. So you, and, and again, that's a very plastic or dynamic uh, phenomena because 
the body cells, they respond to the body needs. So if you start, for example, exercising, what happens is, for example, and depending on what kind of exercise you do, for example, if you uh, run a lot, your leg muscles, they are developed, they, they are strengthened. And again, depending on what kind of running you are doing, if you run slowly or you run fast, and depending on um, uh, yeah, where you're running on an altitude or a client plane or not, it uh, basically increases the strength of your muscle fiber. It doesn't lead to uh, necessarily lead to um, formation of new muscles. That does not usually happen. That may happen, that could happen, but that, that's not usually happen when you uh, do exercises. And or muscle banana allergies, for example, a lot of people use steroids and you have heard this many times. So what does steroid do? So steroids, they also basically um, increase the metabolism in your upper body parts. So the mus muscles on the uh, shoulders and the chest muscles and on the upper body part, they start accumulating a lot of protein. So their metabolism is very high. They increase their uh, myosin actin content and that's why they become swell up. And they, it's also possible to stretch the muscle fiber and make it longer. Uh, so it's basically the size that changes. It's not necessarily the number that is changing. Okay. And with the stem cell regeneration or stem cell renewal, we are talking about the number of cells. Yeah. Secondly, I wanted and? to ask about neural cells. So it's so like, I've heard that uh, your brain cells, they don't, uh, is that related to this? They don't, um, they can't, they don't proliferate. Can you explain um, a little bit? Yes, so brain cells, um, there, were, there is a very interesting experiment that led us to believe that brain cells are also growing. They are not completely end cells. So that this uh, basically observation tells us that there is a some degree of proliferative activity. And that experiment actually was done on, so you know, these um, um, in the uh, 50s, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, nuclear experiments going on. And at that time, the waste disposal for the nuclear experiments or nuclear bomb experiments, that was not very efficient. And it led to the accumulation of a lot of uh, radioisotopes into the plants. And when people ate those plants, that uh, those radioisotopes, they get incorporated into these people and into their you know, bodies and also into their brains. And uh, the good thing about radioisotope is that you can measure very precisely the amount of the radioactivity that they are emitting. So what people have seen, for example, in the United States, uh, they've observed that uh, the people who have, uh, for example, consumed this radio labeled plants in 1950s and 60s, when they looked at their brain activity, the radioactivity coming out from their brain, that radioactivity was increasing steadily. And that was a, uh, basically um, gives you an idea or hint that the brain cells are dividing because there is no other reason why this radioactivity would increase unless you divide, uh, continuously divide the cells. So, but again, I mean, this, uh, there is no direct evidence that the neural cells are growing. And that's a very contentious issue actually in the field. Uh, but I believe that, I mean, personally, I believe that there are stem cells in every uh, tissue of the body. It's just that we do not know how to harness those stem cells or how to identify them and how to use them for our purpose. But maybe with the future research, we will be able to do that. Last year, I, I wanted to ask, yeah. Yeah. Uh, paralysis, is it, is it uh, like irreversible because of this reason? Okay. Paralysis, you have... uh, yes, partly. I mean, it depends on uh, what is the level of paralysis. 
sometimes you can physiologically revert it sometimes i mean it depends on the cause of the paralysis sometimes something there is a tumor that is impinging on part of your brain and that causes uh paralysis and if you remove that tumor the paralysis is gone but then sometimes there is a permanent injury to the brain cells and if that is the case then you need stem cells so neural stem cells and i think i have heard or seen examples or have heard many times that people have recovered from uh miraculously recovered uh mm -hmm. from brain injury or uh, from these kind of things and i, I mean i pre of course as a muslim i believe that uh, allah has you know given us the full repertoire of you know repair and everything but of course as a scientist i would like to understand how this is happening and now i think with this stem cell theory or with the stem cell these experiments it has become possible to at least understand it uh, hypothetically that it is possible okay. but it requires a lot of more work yeah Any more questions? No, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. So, all right. So I will send you a link for the next lecture. And uh, so take care. And shall I see you next week? Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.